Hello, what's up? You goddamn internet, I'm Daniel O'Brien, the host of Obsessive Pop Culture Disorder, a show that gobbles up all the best movies, and music, and TV shows, chews it up, and vomits them back into your mouth like a, like a mama bird. Open your mouth for me, internet. Today's whole thing is about... First conceptualized by Joseph Campbell, the template of the hero's journey shows up in every sci-fi or adventure setting you pretended to occupy as a child. You got your call to adventure, supernatural aid, belly of the whale, road of trials, the meeting with the goddess, and the blowing of the Death Star. That's a fine summation of Luke's hero's journey in Star Wars, but not everyone in Star Wars was Luke Skywalker. Most, you'll notice if you rewatch the franchise, were not by a pretty big margin. Today we'll be exploring them and all the other non-heroes in a hero's journey. According to nerds, Spock Lobster was born in 2230 and would go on to meet Captain Kirk as second commander of the Enterprise in 2265 and be best friends until the year 2293 when Kirk is presumed dead after being sucked into a temporal pleasure ribbon called the Nexus. Then Kirk chops some wood and horse races Patrick Stewart before old man grappling with Malcolm McDowell on a space bridge, falling off that space bridge, and then actually dying in a heap. Just a, just a heap of Captain. That all happens when Spock is 63 years old, and so his relationship with Kirk and presumably his other Enterprise buddies lasted roughly 30 years of his life. While that seems like a lot of time, keep in mind that that the average Vulcan lifespan is actually 200 years. Every Vulcan knows that every human friendship they have will represent a fraction of the time they're alive. You have found him, Captain Picard. That's Spock showing up in the next generation with a solid 76 years under his belt since the passing of Kirk. That means Spock has spent about 80% of his time living in a world without his best friend. You know what other best friends last about a sixth of your total lifespan? <laughs> dogs. Adorable, scruffy little pooches that you love for 13 years and then Barry, except my dog, who has been trained very specifically to live forever, and will in fact be burying me if I die, which I won't. And sure, you'll mourn, and you'll always love that little buddy, but eventually you'll wander into the pound and find the new best friend, because you've been taught all your life that pets come and go, and are therefore a little farther down the line on the emotional attachment totem pole, just like Kirk must have been for Spock. I'm gonna miss you. Suddenly, the idea that Vulcans are mostly distant compared to humans makes sense when you realize that Kirk is the species equivalent of that excitable, humping, reactionary beast that barks at a strong wind. And Vulcans, who might not always understand that reaction, know that it's simply a byproduct of this fleeting, emotional creature they've chosen to befriend and occasionally have sex with. So it, is Spock like a dog? There's not a great one-to-one -one parallel I can make if we're going with the Humans are like dogs to Vulcans comparison. Hi Zoe Saldana. When you think about it, finding out that the entire world was actually a false construct existing in a smoldering futurescape was actually the best thing to happen to Neo, who starts the Matrix series as a lonely office drone living in a one bedroom apartment filled with electronic misery tokens and cash stuff philosophy books. From there, he gets thrown through the cyber apocalypse ringer and comes out the other end as a Kryptonian goth thing, complete with a girlfriend who looks like one of Zod's henchmen. They get to bone in a Caves surrounded by candles and tribal music like you like. And in the end, even his death is this grand techno-Jesus accord to free the minds of everyone unknowingly trapped in the Matrix world. Really, the only thing he didn't factor in was whether or not everyone still living in the Matrix hadn't lost their goddamn minds already thanks to the otherworldly shenanigans and acts of brutal terrorism caused by his crusade. Let's go all the way back to the first film, when Neo walks into a peaceful lobby and balls out mass murders a group of security guards. Those aren't... Sinister programs, or agents, but regular 9 to 5 security personnel that Neo is gunning down like Nazi zombies. There is no spoon. There is no spoon? That's great, Neo. There is no spoon. But you know what there is no no of? Those 20 plus ragdoll corpses you incinerated who were living, breathing humans plugged into the Matrix. If you're killed in the Matrix, you die here? The body cannot live without the mind. Well, the mantra early on is that it's permissible to kill anyone unknowingly working alongside of the agents for the sake of humanity. Humanity doesn't know that. All humanity is seeing is a lunatic dressed like an evil priest kung fu slaughtering the innocent. And now that he's publicly established himself as a straight up domestic terrorist, Neo spends the rest of the series soaring over the city like a magical Osama bin Laden. By the second film, he and his gang of leather-bound misfits are flying around and having elaborate car chases with ghost soldiers in broad daylight. I mean... What does the news say the next day? A lot of good people were murdered by a trench coat wearing man with no clear motive, and also he flies? In probably related news, everyone in the world appears to be slowly turning into just this one guy. It's this guy. If you or someone you know is this guy, tell someone in the government why. Now to Steve for the weather. Nope, Steve is one of those Asian guys now. Okay, good. Bye Steve, F the weather. By the time Agent Smith has overrun the city with his likeness, people are probably boarding up their houses like it's Night of the Living Limo Drivers. Then Neo saves the day by making everyone explode, and whatever's left of humanity somehow learns that the guy best known for spree shooting civilians was actually mankind's supreme savior this whole time. 
Hey, thanks a lot. So, so glad to leave my cozy apartment and Wi-Fi to eat ration slop in the Earth's scorched mantle. You really pulled us through by killing all those innocent people, Neo. Imagine for a moment that you are a teenage boy sneering around a 1990s New York City trying to score cigarettes and lady friends. Suddenly, Sam Rockwell shows up and brings you to this big warehouse full of gambling and video games and graffiti walls and hip-hop music and skateboarding ramps and you're all like, got any cigarettes? And he's like, regular or mental? How cool would that be? The Foot Clan's lair is like a goddamn Dave and Buster's. It's every 90s kid's dream, right down to hanging out with Skeet Ulrich. Skeet? Remember Skeet? So you're hanging out with Skeet. And suddenly, all the lights dim and you're escorted into this big concrete warehouse for the ceremonial entrance of a guy dressed like a Mortal Kombat character who's there to bestow bug-eyed ninja masks and rant about f***ing turtles. Good God. Together we will punish these turtles. You, my friend, are now in a cult. That's what a cult looks like. You got, it's a cult. You got drawn in with a promise of smoking cigarettes and getting teenage kicks. And now, you're front and center in a bunker dojo swearing your allegiance to a sharp, pointy, count of some kind. This is your family. I am your father. I can't believe there wasn't even one kid who was like, oh, I think I'm at the wrong thing. I only joined this gang because I was acting out uh, because I'm a teenager. And this seemed like a good way to piss off my parents while also having a controlled environment in which to skateboard. Probably though, I'll just get a tattoo or something. I, I don't really have any opinions on turtles. So I feel like I'm not the guy you want for this. Remember, the first TMNT starts at a point where the turtles are not well-known vigilantes. So if you were in that audience, you'd have to assume that this guy was talking about actual turtles. At least until you accidentally ran into the giant mutant rat he has tied up in storage. Probably the most surprising part of joining a cult that wants you to fight giant turtles is that you actually have to fight giant turtles. Unlike every other cult in the world, the Foot Clan seriously delivers on its kooky premise. No doubt to the dismay of all the teenagers that were just coasting through every dragon doji session in order to get back to playing pit fighter and listening to MC Hammer. After all, these teenagers might be outcasts, but these teenagers are still teenagers, right? How many rebel skater punks do you suppose are interested in both getting wasted in a warehouse and becoming disciplined at karate? If Shredder really wanted a crew of ninja fighters, he should have opened a gym instead or set up a career day booth or something. Anything but luring in the least accountable group of ruffians, giving them cigarettes and then saying, hey everyone, let's all gather around and team karate. Don't forget to stretch. Speaking of Stone Cold Ruffians, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is about a pair of fun-loving metalheads who use the power of bending space-time to cram for a school history test by physically kidnapping historical figures. If you haven't seen the film, because it's a bit past your generation, then I don't think explaining it to you is going to help. I mean, we don't even have phone booths anymore. There's so much explanatory ground I'd have to cover just in the setup of this movie. And this isn't even the one with death and station. The point is that it's a good-natured time romp that charmed a nation with radical catchphrases and Keanu Reeves and and, uh, San Dimas High School Ah, uh, I was gonna say it with that guy. All right. Anyway, it turns out that this movie is way more horrifying than it lets on. Solely by checking the roster of the people Bill and Ted choose to cram together in their little TARDIS. There's Billy the Kid, Abraham Lincoln, Genghis Khan, Sigmund Freud, Ludwig von Beethoven, Joan of Arc, Socrates, and Napoleon. All at their most recognizable ages, all from varying and overlapping eras in history, and all of them huddled together in a shitty time-traveling phone booth like a bunch of temporal refugees. If you haven't realized why that's potentially horrifying yet, I'll break it down for you. Let's start with the fact that Billy the Kid, the first guy they pick up, looks to be about 20 years old. Maybe he's 19, maybe he's 21. My point is that he certainly isn't 23 because Billy the Kid was shot to death when he was 22. Something Sigmund Freud, an educated man who lived at the same time as Billy, probably knows about. You might think that Freud had the greater sense not to bring that up, but you bet your ass Billy wouldn't show the same restraint for someone like Abraham Lincoln, who was assassinated 20 years before he was born. The kid even escaped execution in a town named after Lincoln. There's pretty much no conversation these people could have that wouldn't end with the universe exploding like a bowl of beans in the microwave. Not to mention that the film ends with them all just hanging out in a mall where there's, you know, bookstores. They probably have very disheartening information in their nonfiction section. Considering that they are specifically there to tell their life stories, it's a miracle that none of them accidentally learned a few spoilers. You think Joan of Arc would have gone back to the toasty 1400s after spending an hour in Barnes and Noble? I don't think so. The only other explanation is that these people believe they are either undergoing the most vivid of batshit dreams or having some kind of religious experience. <gasps> Ginger snaps. Did Bill and Ted kill Joan of Arc? Dudes, you guys are gonna go back in time. Yeah. The movie shows that. Time exists as a predestined loop, which means that Bill and Ted had always gone back in time to affect these people's lives. That means the stories of Joan of Arc meeting God might have actually been her bombing through time and crashing aerobics classes. God, to her, might have been Bill and Ted, which could be totally accurate, since they also go back in time and encounter cavemen. For all we know, tasting that chewing gum was the catalyst spark for the complex thought leading to our very dominance on Earth. Sweet. Jesus, I have to tell everyone. 
Hello? Is this everyone? This is Dan. I wanted to... Oh. Never mind, it's the pharmacy. I just called the pharmacy. I don't know why I thought I'd have everyone's number. That's probably good for this episode. Join me next time to learn about mermaids, I guess. Just a bunch of murmurs about mermaids coming into my ear. Maybe it's just a pretty fish. Don't know. Too soon to tell. Yeah, we don't use papers anymore. I got the guy that just tells me that thing. Show's getting pretty big. Okay, bye. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, make sure you subscribe and like the video. If you're sad that the video's not on anymore, you can watch it again, uh, or you can just click around. There will be other videos with me in them. You just keep watching them all until a new one comes out again. Never stop watching videos.